Appreciate it. Can everybody hear me okay? This is my Justin Timberlake apparatus. Uh, hopefully we won't have a wardrobe malfunction. It feels a little off-putting. It's kind of like a retainer. Um, thank you so much for hosting, and it's just, this is really one of the most distinguished rooms in the state. It's always a, a pleasure to be here. I'd like, by way of beginning, to introduce my mother, Jean Arsenault Sledge. Um, she's 90, and came here, and they, they had a nice pheasant under glass for us in the reading room back there that, that came, I think, from Firehouse Subs. I didn't know they did pheasant under glass, but anyway, she, many of you may know my father's World War II memoir with the old breed, and, and mom was really the first person to see the potential for that book and, and held him up and helped, helped him finish that. And so she's uh, responsible not only for that book, but it's, it's follow-up memoir, China Marine, and then all of mine. So really an alarming number of books in the world are growing and alarming them, and I, and I certainly thank her. She's one of my first readers, and it's, it's always a privilege to hear what she says. And it's not always favorable Any, <laughs> anyway, but, she, but you need that. So what I want to do today commission and she said one of the things she wanted to do to celebrate it was to do a line of books and I said well uh, you know we really don't have a good battle history of the Civil War in Alabama we have books about the politics and you know specific events like the Battle of Mobile Bay but it's not just a good readable history of what took place here we know about Little Round Top and we know about uh, Virginia and what the boys did in Tennessee but but I think what happened here, though perhaps not as significant or important, nonetheless had consequences, not least for the people who, who suffered through them, and that that story should be told. She was enthusiastic about it, and so full speed ahead. And um, this was the image I chose for the cover. I was looking for something that would convey some of a sense of, of combat, but also drama. And this is a scene called Wilson's Charge. It was painted in 1994 by a gent named Don Stivers, now sadly deceased, and it depicts uh, General Wilson's climactic charge at the Battle of Selma in the spring of 1865. And I like the sense of hurry and the sense of drama that this, that this brought to it. Now I'm going to try to advance this. I'd like to start by talking a little bit about two of the women that really gave me my path as a historian. This is my grandmother on my father's side, Mary Frank Sturdivant Sledge. She was born in 1894, died in 1989, lived much of her life in Mobile. And she was just a marvelous storyteller, had a real gift for bringing the past alive for children. And she was a great listener uh, in her youth. She had talked to people who had remembered the war, who had been in it, who had been soldiers or children or Confederate women or blockade runners or uh, slaves. She, she had just gathered an amazing number of stories. And her home was a place called Georgia Cottage, uh, so named for the original owner's peach state roots. It was built about 1840. It sits on Spring Hill Avenue, still stands today in Mobile. And it's most famously associated with Augusta Jane Evans, and we see her portrait down at lower right. Miss Gusta, as we commonly call her, uh, was 22 years old when her family bought the house in 1860. And her father was a commission merchant, but not a very successful one. He didn't make a lot of money at it. But she had started writing novels and was very good at that and started making a lot of money on them. So she actually made the money to buy the house and wrote books like Vashti, At the Mercy of Tiberius, um, St. Elmo, After the War, one of her most famous novels, not at all read today. Very flowery in that Victorian mode, and um, she was an autodidact, and she loved to sort of show off her learning on the printed page, and also in her correspondence. She wrote letters to Confederate politicos and officers, which these lengthy classical and biblical allusions that perhaps no one but the graduate of a great book school could, could get. And I sort of wonder what these very busy uh, men of affairs did with these, these multi-page letters when they got them. Mobile's most famous socialite at the time, a woman named uh, Octavia Walton Lavert, said that the only problem with an Augusta Jane Evans uh, heroine is that she's swallowed an unabridged dictionary. 
But nonetheless, the house was suffused with the spirit of Miss Gusta, and uh, Gran, rather, had kept all of her books and, and had them in the hallway there. And so this was where I would go as a child for Christmases and holidays, and so memorable coming from upstate Alabama because it was coastal, there was Spanish moss, you could smell the paper mills and the salt. It was just an exotic, different kind of place then and now, and the people seemed to me larger than life, both living and dead. And so Gran was just this great storyteller. And we'd sit in the front left parlor where her bedroom was, and she had a delightful coal fireplace. I don't know if you've ever experienced a coal fire, uh, but you're going to because coal is the future. Um, it's the most bone penetrating and satisfying heat there is. And so I would sit on a bolster in front of that fireplace, and she would just spin these stories. And <clears throat> she would sometimes fabricate the facts as she went along. Uh, and as I got older, I learned to appreciate that and, and balance it out. But what mattered was her voice and the immediacy of the past. And when I was about 10, I became fascinated by the Alamo. And so Gran gave me what she said was a powder flask from the siege of the Alamo. So I went and told Dad it was a little brass thing with a spigot and a screw-on cap and a little chain. And I said, Dad, Dad, Gran gave me a powder flask from the Alamo. And Dad looked at it and he said, hell, that's a GI oil can like I carried in the Pacific. <laughs> Somewhat deflating, and I wish I had it now. I, I don't know what happened to it, but I vividly remember it. And this is a this will establish hopefully my bona fides as far as, is that in focus for y'all? As far as my interest in the topic goes, um, this is a little uh, charcoal sketch I made of the CSS Alabama in the front parlor of Georgia Cottage in uh, about 50 years ago, and, and that gives me some pause. My daughter refers to me as yesterday's man. Um, but we would also site visit. We'd go to places where these events had happened, and Grand could tell stories of people who had been there. Blakely, across the bay, site of one of the last major battles in uh, the war and in Alabama, uh, was a favorite spot. And, of course, my father and his childhood friend, Sid Phillips, had hunted for Civil War relics here as boys. And so Georgia Cottage, the basement, was just full of these artifacts, cannonballs and musket balls that they had found. The other woman who was instrumental in my um, understanding of the past was my aunt, grand sister. She lived in Selma, Octavia Sturdivant Wynn. Here she's photographed about 1957 with her glue pot at the Selma Times Journal. She was a columnist, uh, city editor for many years, and also wrote a column called Up and Down the Town from about 1914 until well into the 1970s. It was an amazing career. And she and her husband, Pinky, so named for his rosy countenance, lived out on the Jefferson Davis Highway. And Tay-Tay would just tell these fantastic stories. She loved history, and she had interviewed people about the past. Uh, People who had found Civil War silver or gold hidden on the property from Wilson's Raid decades before and, and had only just uncovered it. And these kinds of things. Tay Tay kept everything. My father said she was a child of the Depression and if she had smoked, she would have kept her cigarette butts. So after she passed, we, we went to her house to sort of clean everything out. And she, she had these like shoe boxes full of things, papers. Um, oil receipts for the car from the 1960s, um, just bits of new newspaper, an empty can of Brasso, I remember, and bits of old string and long deteriorated rubber bands, and you just think, you know, the easiest thing to do is just chunk all this into the dumpster and, and get on down the road, but you had to go through every piece of paper. In one box, I think there was a $20 gold piece, uh, and then in another, just with all this other stuff, all this other ephemera, was a handwritten letter from Zelda Fitzgerald apologizing for her drunken behavior at some social function they had been at. From the depths of my polluted soul, Zelda with this great flourishing Z. Uh, just, just an amazing experience to know Tay Tay. The centerpiece of Tay Tay's historical interest was Wilson's Raid, that Union Thunderbolt attack down through central Alabama in the wet spring of 1865, and the two dominant personalities were James Harrison Wilson, here on the left, Harry, to his intimates. He was one of the 
youngest officers to wear the Union blue. He was only 27, I think, at the time of the raid. And then Nathan Bedford Forrest, who at the time was 44, former slave trader, Memphis City alderman, uh, fairly unlettered, self-taught, both as a soldier uh, and as a politician, but extremely effective on the field, a force multiplier, if ever there was one. By the time of Wilson's raid, uh, Forrest didn't have much left to oppose. Wilson brought about 13,000 well-trained cavalrymen with Spencer repeating rifles that they could manage easily on horseback. They had a metal tube that inserted into the butt and you had a drop lever on the weapon so you could, you could essentially just fire seven times very quickly and overwhelm a force that was opposing you with fouling pieces or muzzle-loading muskets. The, the rebel soldiers called the Spencer carbine the damn Yankee rifle you can load on Sunday and shoot the rest of the week. <laughs> and they were outnumbered anyway. So the most vivid memory I have of, of Tay-Tay was she, when I was about 10 or so, she came to Montevallo where, where I grew up and spent uh, a day or two with us. And then when it was time to take her home, we all piled in the family car and took her back to Selma. It's about an hour drive. And as my mother said, it was a nonstop account from door to door. Tay-Tay on Wilson's Raid. It started as we crossed the viaduct going over Shoal Creek. There were two big magnolia trees to the right. Tay-Tay said, oh, that's where Wilson tied his gray gilding Sheridan and talked to his officers about how to get to the Briarfield Naval Works and continue his path of destruction. My father, being of a more skeptical mind, said, well, if those trees were there in 1865, they were saplings and not likely to hold a gelding. Fact, though, was not as important to me as color and immediacy. And then south of Ashby, the railroad crosses the highway and then goes arrow straight for Selma all the way. Historically, this was the old Alabama and Tennessee River Railroad. And it turned out that Tay-Tay had known the engineer for Forrest's ordnance train. It had come up from Selma to support the Butternuts as they were trying to oppose these hard-riding Yankees. And so it was backing with the Confederate troops as they retreated this entire route. One Confederate soldier said, I'm confident that Wilson drove us 15 miles an hour most of the time. The engineer had been only 18 years old at the time, <clears throat> but an indomitable character. And he had talked to Tay-Tay about how the, the Spencer balls knocked bark off the pine trees and slammed into the iron locomotive and how his engineer, not his engineer, his fireman, wanted to desert, wanted to jump off, and how he threatened him with uh, one of these big hammers uh, that he'd better not jump off the train. And so again, just as we're driving along and these pine trees are flashing in and out of the sun and these you know, gleaming tracks on creosote bed, uh, all of that just gave a sense of drama to the tale. Then we'd stop in a little community called Stanton, place called Ebenezer Baptist Church. And so here we would get moon pies and an RC, as my dad called them, at this claptrap gas station, sadly shuttered up. And we'd talk, uh, and Tay Tay would describe the Battle of Ebenezer Church, where Forrest finally put together about 2,000 men to oppose the Yankees, but they were, of course, swept away, couldn't withstand the onslaught. And it was at this little kerfuffle that Forrest had one of his personal uh, confrontations. A young Indiana captain charged the line and found himself in a personal duel on horseback with Forrest. Now Forrest carried a saber and, and used it, but he preferred a pistol, which could be managed at a trot. Unfortunately, he was a disadvantage. His sword wasn't drawn, and this young Indianan is wailing away on him with a saber, and they're thundering along. It's about a 200-yard running duel. Forrest's hand is getting cut up. He's trying to block these blows. He later told Wilson, if that boy had known enough to use the point of his sword rather than the edge of it, I wouldn't have been here to, to tell you about it. Uh, I think it was Emerson who wrote that if you strike at a king, you must kill him. Well, the young Indianan wasn't getting the job done, and finally Forrest was able to spur his mount ahead enough to take his pistol and turn around and drill the young captain. The young captain is buried behind this church with about a dozen of his comrades. And I just recall being very moved by this, thinking, you know, here are these young guys from rural Midwest, Indiana, Illinois, who were not a whole lot older than I was, died far from kith and kin, 
in a place where nobody's ever likely to visit their grave or mourn their loss. Then we came into Selma, which was really the high point of the tour because Tete was a docent at Sturdivant Hall, that magnificent antebellum mansion right in town, and so we would climb the rickety staircase up to the cupola. Here we see it on the left as it was photographed in the 1930s. And then at the top we would look out and she would describe the battle and the retreat at Selma. And th this was an amazing experience because the Parkman family who had lived in the home during the war had done exactly that. They'd gone up into the cupola to watch this drama unfold. The Confederate defenses, of course, were undermanned and mostly old men and young boys and jaded veterans, and so they were overwhelmed. And, you know, as we're looking out over the green trees and the well-tended flower beds, that sort of is replaced by this apocalyptic vision of dust and smoke and noise and panicked horses and running servants yelling, the Yankees are coming, and yet the Yankees are coming. And then the men thunder up to the house and the booted troopers come through and start ransacking drawers and out into the yard where they're shooting dogs and chickens and just complete chaos. And Tete was able to make all that come alive. So that's really the prologue of the book, is Chasing Wilson's Raiders with Aunt Octavia, where I write about that experience and a little bit about why I was moved to write this book. And then we just move into the war itself. Of course, it begins uh, with secession in 1861. This is Verena Howell Davis on the left, Jefferson Davis's wife, and Natchez Planner's daughter. Of course, Davis himself had been a senator and a former Secretary of War, as they called it then. It would be Secretary of Defense today. Then on the right, we see his inauguration. There's a famous photograph of that from which this sketch is taken. As far as the cause of the war, let there not be any doubt, it was slavery. Uh, you don't have to spend very long in the records to realize that that's startlingly the case. And then we sort of look at some of the first actions north and south. On the left we see an early incident from the blockade down off Mobile Bay, and then on the right an incident from the Tennessee River up near Florence. That's what the Union soldiers called a timber clad. It's basically a big gunboat, riverboat, that's wrapped in five inch thick uh, oak siding that was meant to protect the men from snipe or sharpshooters, as they would have called them then, on southern rivers. And early in 62, after the fall of Fort Henry in Tennessee, the Tyler, which is the name of this vessel and three others, were the first, they took the war deeper into Alabama than, than any other Union force and actually occupied Florence for a brief period of time. So the war in the Tennessee Valley is a major part of this book. Huntsville was taken and reoccupied four times, Florence over a dozen, and there was significant civilian resistance in the valley. Talk about the various raids, Rousseau's raids, and then Strait's raid, which is very famous. This is uh, Colonel Abel Strait on the left. He was an Indianan in his 30s. And then on the right, we see a monument to Emma Sansom, a name that many of you might remember from Alabama history. Strait was a committed abolitionist, and he had the bright idea that he could take a mounted force through North Alabama into Georgia and block the railroad north of Atlanta, which would deprive General Bragg of supplies up in Tennessee and force him to pull back. Straight superiors approved the idea, but unfortunately, as sometimes happens, if any of you are veterans or have been in the military, you'll well know how the U.S. Army can sometimes do things. Um, first, his superior decided he couldn't spare the horses and the men would have to be mounted on mules. And then he decided he couldn't spare the cavalrymen and he'd have to take infantrymen. So the upshot was he had 1,700 farm boys who, you know, didn't have a lot of experience necessarily riding horses. and they, uh, they had to break in these mules, and they were not the best quality mules. A lot of them had distemper. Many of them had been shod. They were cantankerous. If you've read Faulkner's famous pay into the mule in one of his novels, I think it's The Mansion, he, said, he, he says that the mule will work for you patiently for 10 years for the privilege of kicking you once. And that was the experience of these young bluecoats as they tried to break in these mules when they would jump on their back the animal would take off on what the troops called a sheep gallop. It would run about 100 yards, 
then it would plant its forefeet and kick up its hindquarters and just catapult the soldier over its head. So lots of broken arms and bruised egos as a result of getting this force ready. Mules are also incredibly noisy if you spend any time around them. They bray all the time for breakfast, for a snack, for lunch, for dinner, for this, for that. So what that meant was that a blind, half-deaf man could have followed this host over Hill and Dale from three miles away. And not surprisingly, the locals took to calling it the Jackass Brigade. <laughs> Unfortunately for Strait, he was bested by a teenage girl in General Forrest, who was chasing him with about a third of as many men all along the, his route. And near Gadsden, which is where this monument is, Emma Sansom showed Forrest where a critical ford was to get his men across. And Far Forrest uh, later left an eloquent note, not really eloquent, but semi-literate note for her, thanking her for her service to the Confederacy. Supposedly at one point a uh, bullet clipped her dress and she said they've only wounded my crinoline. She later moved to Texas and married and was interviewed by a Forrest biographer after the war. Strait was forced to surrender and um, was really humiliated by the whole episode. We talk a lot too in the book about ordinary Alabamians who were caught up in this chaos on the left is a uh, soldier from Montevallo. It's called Jim Goes to the War on His Pony. And it's the only known photograph of a mounted Alabama soldier. His right hand is bandaged, and he's holding a musket with it, what looks to be the bayonet attached. This might explain the bandaged hand. Uh, it would be difficult to manage a musket on a horse. Of course, during the Civil War, Western cavalry, and by Western, I mean in the Western theater, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, really fault as what you would call dragoons. They would ride to where they were going and then they would dismount to do their actual fighting. And then on the right we see a man named Gus Askew photographed in the 1930s. He had been a slave in Barber County, nine years old, when the war ended. And he vividly remembered and told the WPA interviewers about the day that the Union forces came in and took Eufaula. And his memories were their big horses, their big black boots, their clanking accoutrements and their rough soldier talk and how intimidating they were. And he was more interested in getting away with his friends uh, and being unsupervised. But he had a long life. He never forgot those moments decades before. That really changed his entire world because after that, he was free. Of course, there's a whole chapter on the Battle of Mobile Bay where Farragut famously commanded, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And here we see the Tennessee, which was built at Selma, floated down river and confronted the Hartford there on the right at the Battle of Mobile Bay. One contemporary said that the Hartford shots on the Tennessee's casemate had no more effect than a, than a shot, uh, pop gun pellet might be expected to produce on a buffalo skull. Nonetheless, the Union fleet prevailed. It got into Mobile Bay and the city lost its strategic significance as a blockade running port, but it itself would not fall till the following spring at the Battle of Spanish Fort and Blakely. And here we see a contemporary illustration of the Battle of Blakely. Um, it was the largest infantry fight in Alabama. Ironically, it took place nine hours after Lee's surrender at Appomattox. General Grant was very grumpy about this. He said it needn't have been fought at all if we just simply waited the city would have fallen into our hands with no cost whatsoever. As it was, several hundred men were killed and wounded on each side, but it was the largest infantry assault that late in the war, 16,000 blue coats, including a large number of black regiments, former slaves from Louisiana, Mississippi, North Alabama, who had a great incentive to fight because if they had been captured, they would have been re-enslaved. Uh, and this force surged forward. They were resisted by about two or 3,000 Confederates. And as one young butternut said, it appeared to me that all hell had been turned loose. And then just finally, uh, the book ends in 1865, and I write about the devastation that the war caused within Alabama. And if I can use a, a Bernie Sanders, Sanders pronunciation, the infrastructure was devastated. Here we see a uh, bridge over the Tennessee that's been destroyed and they're, they're putting a pontoon bridge up beside it. Public property, anywhere there had been fighting or troops was pretty well gone, depots, railroads, warehouses, things like that, in many cases private property. 
Um, Athens had been sacked early in the war. Selma, of course, had caught fire, and there was great destruction there. Mobile suffered a great magazine explosion immediately after the war, which devastated its downtown. And then, of course, not to mention the social disruptions, the huge number uh, of men killed and wounded, and the drain that that would place on the state, and just the abject poverty that would plague Alabama for, for many decades. And so all of those things had a, a searing impact on people's consciousnesses, and I think in part explain the passion and the power of the stories that have since come down to us. Y'all have been very patient, and I appreciate it. I'm happy to answer any questions, and um, thank you for coming. So if you would please raise your hand, and either myself or Wesley over there will uh, pass you the microphone. Two questions, please. At Blakely, you say there were 16,000 Union forces, uh, and a large number of them were black regiments. Can you give an idea of what the number of the black regiments were there? It was not a majority. It may be 1,500 men, mostly on the right on the Union right, where the attack first happened. So they pushed off first, then the rest of the line followed. Uh, but it was a definitely a significant portion. There were also stories, uh, and I think factual accounts, that in some cases uh, surrendering Confederates or unarmed Confederates were shot by these troops. There was a great deal of emotion in this, because you may have heard about the massacre at Fort Pillow, which uh, has been a concert happened at Fort Pillow. And in fact, when they of them were, were shouting, remember Fort Pillow. So there was a sense of we're now going to extract revenge. Uh, Union officers qu quickly regained control, however. And that was certainly not what everybody did, but there were some instances of troops out of control. On the cover photo uh, or cover painting that you used for your, your book, uh, you say it was painted in 1994. Uh, I did not recognize the battle flag that was used there. Could you talk about that briefly? Yeah, let me uh, see if I can get back to that. Um, Wilson wrote about uh, having a blood red battle flag that he would go into battle with. He had a personal escort as well. And so I think what the painter's done, uh, he's clearly done a lot of research here, uh, is the flag on the right is probably Wilson's personal battle flag. It's basically a red flag with crossed sabers on it, square, as, as many of them were. Of course, there would have been plenty of American flags and regimental flags with among those troops as well. And they have, by the way, an incredible collection of Civil War banners in this archive. They also have Forrest Glove from his fraca at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Not the bloodied one, but the good one. He threw uh, he, two widow ladies in Plannersville, treated him, and, and in gratitude, he gave them his good glove, no longer needing it. And I think decades later they gave it to the archive, and so uh, they're really tangible relics from those days in these very walls. John, um, of course people still argue about all kinds of things about this war. One thing that I've noticed in looking at blogs is people arguing about the extent to which enslaved African Americans were employed in the Confederate effort. What did you uncover when you were researching and writing this book about that? Well, there was extensive uh, use of slaves for labor, particularly at Selma on the fortifications and at Mobile, which was one of the most heavily fortified cities in the nation at that time. They had three big rings of earthworks and artillery going around it. And there are accounts of planters and planters' wives grumbling because Confederate impressment officers were going into the Black Belt and dragooning quantities of black slaves to go south to work at Mobile. And they promised they'd pay the planter $1.50, $2 a day, they'd supply the tools, they'd feed them and clothe them. And so, you know, what ended up happening is they kept them in warehouses by the river, fed them mule meat, and then they went out onto the earthworks all day and worked in big labor gangs where they could be whipped for, for you know, if the overseers thought they were going too slow. So. They certainly weren't willing, but they didn't have any choice. Um, now, there are other more complica complicated stories within that. Mobile had a significant Creole community. These were free blacks who were the um, heirs uh, 
of white colonial planners of French and Spanish extraction who had married, in some cases, their black slaves or kept them as concubines. And so you sort of had a middle caste that was referred to as the Creole caste. They owned property. They had their own schools. When Spain turned what would become that part of Alabama over the United States, they actually signed a treaty guaranteeing them that they would not lose their privileges. Of course, that would steadily erode as the antebellum period advanced, but many did own slaves, and some actually wanted to volunteer for Confederate service. The commander at Mobile, a guy named General Murray, he was only about five feet, two inches tall. Um, as one soldier said, he was, ever, uh, he was every inch a soldier, but there weren't that many inches of him. Uh, and he, if you've ever seen the photographs, he liked to wear these big, sort of thigh-high cavalry boots. And so the troops, always apt for felicitous metaphor, started calling him Puss in Boots. Um, <laughs> But he was a good general, a good defender of Mobile, knew what had to be done. And so Puss in Boots basically said, you know, we've got this, these Creoles who, who want to enlist. He's writing Richmond, the government, and I'd love to put them into an artillery company. And Richmond writes back and says, you know, I'm sorry, but our position before the world will not uh, allow the use of Negroes as soldiers. <clears throat> And so Murray writes back and says, well, I think you have a misconception. They're, though they do have some black blood, they are, you know, sort of a quaint colonial holdover. And here's the story, and I think they'd make capable troops, and Richmond still refused. So locally they did use them as a home guard, probably to patrol the streets or keep civic order. But they were not allowed into formal Confederate service. John, would you talk about the uh, guerrilla warfare in the Tennessee Valley? And Yes, uh, uh, that's Ed Bridges, by the way, former director of this August institution and the author himself of a very, very fine Alabama history book, beautifully illustrated, that I, that I can highly recommend. Um, not everybody in Alabama supported the Confederacy, obviously. The secession vote was, I think, 61 to 39, and it was uh, by... Uh, legislators who were elected to um, decide this issue. It was not a popular mandate, in other words. So you had significant pockets of resistance, not just in Alabama but in the South, of unionist sentiment, people who didn't feel that they had uh, a stake in this war. There was a rich man's war, a poor man's fight, and they tended to correlate with the lowest slave ownership. So areas like the Hill Country, Winston County, most famously, if you've been there and seen that unique monument that's half Confederate, half uh, Union, uh, the slave ownership, well, slave population of Winston County was like 3%, so it was negligible. And down in the southeast portion of Alabama as well. Now, early in the war, the Union thought that there'd be a lot of Unionist sentiment and that when their armies got down there, people would rebel against the plantocracy who had gotten them into this mess and it would be over. So when Strait came through, for instance, and then also when the timberclads came down the Tennessee, a lot of Unionists came out flying the flag and expressing their love for the, the old country. But unfortunately, there wasn't enough momentum there to build on. And as the war advanced and the costs went up and people had relatives and so forth in the service, there was more support for the Confederacy in that sense. But then you had deserters and you had people who just didn't want to fight. Uh, who would sort of hide in the swamps of the hills. And there's a very good history by Chris McElwin called Civil War Alabama, and he writes a lot about unionism and political dissent in Alabama during those years. By no means was it universal, but there were significant pockets of it, so that you had a quasi guerrilla war going on for much of the time. One of the reasons the war is significant in Alabama is because Early on, there was a reconciliation policy with, with uh, citizens. Lincoln said, when you go down there, don't abuse the citizens. Let's treat them well, and they'll come back, and we can end this thing. And then it was really at Athens, Alabama, that had played a significant role in turning that policy around. There had been so much civilian resistance to the Union among the rich planter counties along the Tennessee, and then they actually ran out a little Union detachment of Athens the Union troops went back in and sacked the city and strewed molasses on people's carpets and broke their mirrors and announced that they weren't going to handle them with kid gloves anymore. And there was a great deal of shock around the nation at this change in attitude towards civilians. And so that was significant for North Alabama because then that augured what's going to happen later in Georgia 
under General Sherman, where hard war has come, and the Union attitude to the South was, well, if you're going to continue this, you're going to pay a price. We have a family tradition that my great-great-grandmother in uh, northeastern Cherokee County, uh, the Yankees piled her household goods out in the yard and burned them, including her children's furniture. Um, I've been trying to determine the most likely occasion for this. Uh, Notice that uh, I think late in 1864, uh, Sherman came from uh, Atlanta, Galesville, Cherokee County, at least nine days there. And I'm supposing that uh, uh, probably his, I understand that a major part of his force was with him. Right. I've been trying to. Uh, learn a little bit more about that uh, situation. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. And of course, you'll hear many stories to this day from families who you know, have passed down stories of that kind of depredation. For instance, Wilson on his raid strictly forbade any kind of looting of civilian property. He said, we're only going to make war on the government here. It's almost over. But of course, he had 13,000 men and there were detachments scattered all over central Alabama. And, you know, so there was no way they could supervise everybody at the same time. Early on when Selma fell and it was chaotic and the retreating Confederates set thousands of cotton bales on fire Riverside and ammunition was blowing up and escaped slaves were running uh, and, it, you know, it was just confusion. There was a good bit of looting. There was some personal property, um, a lot of crime that there was no way to report or trace back. And by the time Wilson kind of got in town and got his forces there, he was able to get all that under control. And, you know, if, if people were concerned about their safety, he'd post a guard on their street and things like that. But it was in those first hours when, it, uh, when the city fell that there was a great deal of that kind of looting. And then subsequently on the march across Alabama toward Georgia, there were a good many of those kind of stories. And um, unfortunately, war brings out both the best and the worst. People, there's a famous story about uh, Judge John Bragg, who lived uh, in Lowndes County. And troopers went into his house and made great show of doing a mock hanging of him in the dining room. There was a hook in the ceiling, and they threw a rope over it and stood him up on a piano and put the rope around his neck. And his wife and children are hysterical, and um, you know they think the men are going to hang him. And then at the last minute, either they never really meant to, or they became moved uh, by the children's plight and took him down. And um, so, but those kinds of things were very searing for people, and those, those would stay in memory for a long, long time. And when there was pain and and wrong on both both sides to go to go around, and hopefully I've brought some of that out in this book as well. I wanted to uh, go back to the question of unionism, uh, union sentiment uh, in the uh, Tennessee Valley. Uh, do you have any thoughts about why there was such a strong, high degree of union, uh, anti-secessionist sentiment uh, around Huntsville and that area? Since Huntsville was a center, one of, one of the plantocracy centers of the right. South that had more than half the population was slave, and yet among the elite, there was a great deal of rather uh, pro-union sentiment. It might have right. shifted. I've heard that there was a fear of that they would be caught between the upper and lower millstone if Tennessee, for instance, yeah. didn't secede. But, but do you have any comment on that? That sounds like the voice of Robert Gamble, uh, who's the best architectural historian in the state and a very elegant and graceful writer himself. His uh, uh, Alabama Robert Gamble, if you're not. Uh, <laughs> and I know you have a North Alabama connection. Um, but yes, they, there was uh, the Tennessee Valley you know, their, their loyalties and economy was more tied to the Mid-South than the Deep South. Their cotton didn't go down the town Bigby, Alabama, through Mobile to the Gulf. It went to Tennessee River on into the Ohio River and then down the Mississippi. So, so what Kentucky and Tennessee were doing was of much more to concern to them than what Alabama and Mississippi were doing. And, um, you know, I think even among the elites, there was by no means, even in Mobile, Deep South Mobile, by no means universal support for the war. 
early on because they recognize that the first thing that's going to happen is a blockade. And that's going to kill the economy. It's, it's going to make everything impossible. And in fact, once the blockade started, a young woman in Mobile said, you know, I'm suddenly noticing we can't get New England ice anymore. I miss ice. It used to come down on schooners and, and big blocks sawn out of Walden Pond and packed in sawdust. So uh, some people were more aware of what the economic consequences were going to be than others. Um, but specifically to Huntsville, I can't say. I know Jeremiah Clemens was from up there, and he was a prominent uh, turncoat. I mean, he both supported secession, and then, then he was a cousin, by the way, of Mark Twain. He supported both sides and flipped it at different times. And it would have been difficult in Huntsville because it would have been hard. You know, a lot of people in a situation like that may not have that strong a conviction one way or the other. They just don't want to get killed. That's their conviction. And, you know, which side do you support? Well, who's going to win here? And it was so hard to tell up there because the armies were just surging back and forth and they both taking your horses and your fodder. And, I mean, you just got sick of all of them after a while. All right, well, if that's all of our questions for today, let's give our speaker another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Be sure to grab a Food for Thought 2018 schedule on your way out, and we'll see you across the street at the Capitol for the big bicentennial announcement and cake. Okay.